Pre former President Carter will be introduced by Bart Seitz, graduating senior. Chairman Grissom, distinguished trustees, President Morrill, parents, fellow graduates, platform guests, ladies and gentlemen. It was obviously beyond the imagination of a 10-year-old boy that on the occasion of his college graduation, he would have the high and distinct honor of introducing an esteemed personal hero <coughs> and former president of our great country. It was almost as remote, at least in my mind, that January night <coughs> in 1975, that the man with whom our family shared its home would ascend to the pinnacle of world leadership. However, as our system, with its imperfections, yet with time-tested success provides, a student, farmer, businessman, scientist, and educator could verify the integrity of the system by serving his nation as its commander-in-chief. Our speaker, ladies and gentlemen, was born in the small farming town of Plains, Georgia. He was educated in the Plains Public Schools, Georgia Southwestern College, Georgia Tech, and received a Bachelor of Science degree from the United States Naval Academy. He accomplished graduate work in nuclear physics. During his naval career, he served around the world, including the Far East, and worked under Admiral Hyman Rickover in the development of the nuclear submarine program. Upon returning to Plains, he became involved <clears throat> in the affairs of his community by serving as chairman of the local board of education. After serving a term in the Georgia State Senate, he became his state's 71st governor. After being elected, after <clears throat> being selected as his party's nominee in July of 1976, he became our nation's 39th president in November of that year. He is currently the university distinguished professor at Emory University. President Carter's example of morality, ethics, and leadership, his zeal for the advancement of human rights, his abiding commitment to peace and accord throughout the world, and his dedication to his own concept of a government as good as its people will no doubt inspire us as we move forward. It is my personal privilege to present our speaker, President Jimmy Carter. Bart Sykes, the young man who gave the introduction, being embraced by Jimmy Carter. He got the honor of introducing him because his father, Dale Sykes, was Carter's Kentucky campaign manager in 1976 asked the former president if he would come and speak at his son's graduation. Carter accepted. Young Bart Seitz got to do the introduction. Former President Carter getting a standing ovation now. And the audience packed into Newland Hall. Now here's former President Carter. Well, little did I expect 12 years ago in 1975 when I made Bart move out of his bed so I could spend a night in his family's house that later he would be in introducing me as a former president of the United States. That was a wonderful introduction and I'm deeply grateful for it and for a chance to come here to one of the finest uh, colleges of which our nation can boast. You don't ever know what kind of introduction you're going to get these days, particularly if you've been in public office and then been defeated for re-election. <laughs> I had a very pleasant four years when I had a standard introduction, no matter where I was, no matter who the introducer was, it was always exactly the same, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. But since I've been out of the White House, I get a wide range of kinds of introductions. Quite often, the program chairman, for instance, is likely to be a Democrat. And then once I accept an, inter an, an invitation to go somewhere, ordinarily the, the head of the whole organization is usually a Republican. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, with it, and when the TV cameras show up, the, the head wants to introduce me. And I never know what kind of introduction I'm going to get. 
Sometimes there's some very uh, sharp and incisive political points made in my introduction, not particularly complimentary to the speaker. <clears throat> so when I get an introduction of that kind, I generally st stand and say to the audience, ladies and gentlemen, of all the introductions I've ever had in my life, that is the most recent. <laughs> Well, I don't have to do that with Bart's introduction. It was beautiful. I know it's better to begin a speech with a joke, to kind of put the audience at ease, and particularly graduates who are just mostly eager for all their ceremonies to get over. I never have been a good storyteller. When I began to run for president in 1975 and six. The nation looked at me as a peanut farmer from South Georgia and said, well, at least he's a southerner, he's a farmer, and he'll be able to tell good stories. <laughs> but it remained to my successor to be able to be the one to tell you know, <laughs> good stories. I'm not very good at it. <laughs> but, you know, everybody has a favorite joke. And when I ran for the state senate, when I ran for governor twice, when I ran for president, I had a favorite joke. And it was very brief. And so not too long ago, I went to Japan to uh, speak at a small religious college not too far from Osaka to a graduation exercise. And I thought that I would give my favorite joke. I don't know if you've ever had a speech translated into Japanese. It takes a lot longer in Japanese than it does in English. So this is a very brief joke, which I'm not going to tell. But anyway, that day, I told my joke, and the interpreter told it much more briefly than I did. And the audience just collapsed in laughter. I have never had such a wonderful response to a joke in my life. I couldn't believe it. So after the speech was over, the students, the graduates were filing out. I went to a holding room, and I turned to the interpreter. I said, you've got to tell me how you told my story. It was the best that I have ever done. He was quite embarrassed. He wouldn't answer. He looked the other way. He fumbled around. He made excuses to go to the restroom and so forth. I said, no, before you go anywhere, you've got to tell me how you told my story. I forced him. And he finally said, Mr. President, I told the audience, President Carter told a funny story. Everybody laughed. <laughs> <laughs> well. So you can see that there are good things and bad things about being a person in, in a prominent political position. I've come here today to talk to you graduates and to the people in the audience who love you. And I know from experience that you'll probably do the same as I did now since 1946, 40, one years ago, when I was graduated from the Naval Academy. I don't remember a thing in the world that the graduation speaker said. I was wondering a little bit about what kind of ship I was going to get. I was mainly thinking about Rosalind, because a, a month later we were going to get married. And I don't even remember who spoke, to, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and I know that after 16 or 17 years, whatever it's been, you don't need another lecture before you finally embark on your life's work. Well, I think that this is a time, though, for you to realize that as a young college graduate, you are among the most fortunate people on earth. Having been endowed with opportunities in life and already accomplishments in life and a status in life that are quite rare because of your own dedication, because of your own competence, because of your own intelligence, because of the love for you of your parents, the sacrifices they've made financially. But, but you already occupy a position of greater material wealth than more than 95% of all the people on earth. And there are some questions that I'll review very briefly that perhaps you'd like to consider as you conclude your undergraduate college work. I understand that at Center College, about 90% of the students eventually go on to graduate work, which is an admirable record. I think compatible with the worldwide reputation that Center College enjoys. I myself have, have, have had a varied life. 
full of excitement, uh, achievement, uh, hope, disappointment, a few uh, tragedies. And you will do the same. And, and I know that as we make, uh, have turning points in our lives, that there, there are times, those are times of reassessment. I've kind of stopped, at least in quiet moments, after the excitement of ceremonies is over, and say, in effect, where do I go from here? What have I done so far? How have I used my only life on earth? Has it laid out a good path? Are the prospects exciting, uh, gratifying, adventurous? inclined toward service, benevolent, considerate, compassionate? Those are the kind of questions that we ask. There have been 39 of us, up to and including me, and now 40, including President Reagan, who've occupied the highest office in the land. And I know that every one of us has gone there different. But we've all asked ourselves one basic question, I'm sure the same. How can I, in my term as president of a great nation, enhance the greatness of my country? How can I, during my two years or four years or six or eight years, whatever it happens to be, make my nation even greater than it was when I arrived for inauguration? And different presidents give different answers to that because we define greatness in different ways. For me, there were a few things, I'm not going to make a speech on this, that were important. One was that I recognized as Commander-in-Chief, as a former naval officer, that ours is the most powerful and influential nation or nation on earth. We're the most powerful militarily. We're the most powerful economically. We are the most powerful nation on earth politically. And, and there are times when we have been the most powerful nation on earth morally. How do you use that influence to enhance the greatness of this country? One way is to use our military power not for confrontations, not for abuse, not for trying to enforce our will on others, not for exacerbating conflict, but for peace. And not just peace between ourselves and potential adversaries like the Soviet Union, but peace for others as well. When there is dissension anywhere on earth, the most powerful voice for the alleviation of conflict can be from the United States. United States of America. Another measurement of greatness, I think, is the enhancement of human rights. Civil rights at home, some say freedom, some say democracy, some say an absence of persecution. But I think our nation has been greatest when it has raised highest the banner of human rights. There are many people on earth today who suffer, and there are many persecutors on earth today. The thing that the oppressors want most is silence from Washington. And the thing that the oppressed want most, or fear most, is silence from Washington. You can search your mind concerning other nations, some very powerful, but the only one that can speak with authority and with effectiveness in any sustained way to alleviate the deliberate persecution of people by their own government is our country. There are other things that could be measured. I'm not going to go down a list. One is a quality of life. We enjoy a very high quality of life in this country. Sometimes we get arrogant 
because of it. We say to ourselves, well, God has given us untold riches, productive land, warm oceans to the east and west, friendly neighbors to the north and south, great economic benefits, liberty. And if we weren't his special people, if we weren't endorsed by God as superior beings, then why would he bless us so much? And it gives us a tendency to look upon ourselves as superior to others. Well, those are the kind of things that a president has to think about. But each individual person has to ask the same question. What can I do to enhance the greatness of my own life? And again, the decisions will be different because the definitions of greatness will be different. And I'm sure that there are times in your life, maybe at high school graduation, maybe now, maybe during career planning sessions, you have said to yourself, what can I do to make my own life most significant? I know what my background is, I know what my talent might be, I know what my shortcomings, failures, or weaknesses might be, I know what my opportunities might be. How can I take all this picture of what I am and make the most of it? And there again, our decisions will be varied according to what we think is greatness. Some people think that the accumulation of wealth is the best measure of success. Some people work only during a lifetime for security in their old age. Some people like social prominence, some like fame. Some like the esteem and congratulations of peer groups in professions, law, education, medicine, and so forth. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. But I'm not sure that that's the utmost measurement of the greatness of a human life. I happen to be a Christian. And the sobering question is, how does God measure my achievements? It's not by longevity. Christ only lived 33 years. It's not by wealth. He never owned anything except a coat. It's not by approbation of his peer group. He was scorned and despised, abandoned. But, but he had a life of service, of dedication to others. And when you go down the list in your own mind of people that you admire most, that is a measure of it. What have those lives meant to others, less fortunate, less influential. Less prominent, less secure, less wealthy. So that's one measurement of a quality of life, of a greatness of a life. And, and, and there is a truism that I've observed many times, and so would you, about age. I've seen 18-year-olds who are already old, whose lives had reached a peak, who through arrogance or selfishness had no more driving inclination to expand their hearts or expand their minds to learn more about God's world, to encompass more people to love, and by whom to be loved. And I've known people 85 years old, including my own mother, who was as young the day she died as any of you in the graduating class. She woke up every morning eager to see what that day held for her. What could she do that was stimulating and exciting and filled with service and gratifying and adventurous and humorous? 
Well, these are some of the questions that I can't answer for you, but that perhaps you can answer yourself. So, the first thing for us to do at a turning point in our lives, whether it's my life or yours, is to analyze our own talents. What do I have with which to work? What are my interests? I think everyone ought to choose a career or way of life that would make them happy. Not to the exclusion or expense of others, but a person that is genuinely happy, filled with joy, or as the Bible says, peace that passeth understanding, are doing something they know is worthwhile, know is compatible with their own talents, abilities, opportunities, and interests. The second thing I would say is to be bold. As you contemplate a future life, or as I, 62 years old, contemplate a future life, the best thing to do is to be bold. Because the only limit we really have to constrain us is a voluntary, self-imposed limit. Limits that we put on ourselves because we underestimate our abilities or the demands or opportunities that we have. I would say another thing to remember as you go through the next few months or years is not to be afraid to seek help. And even at this early stage in your life, you, you should identify a few people, probably including your parents, not always, to whom you can turn for advice and with whom you can share the, most, the innermost secrets of your life. Maybe an older person that you would trust. It's, it's not a sign of weakness to go to someone and say, I need your help. I, I've reached a blind alley in my life. I've reached a disappointment that I didn't anticipate. I've had a setback or a grief that's difficult for me to bear. So make plans to seek help. Another one of this is the next to last one is to expect trouble. A lot of people go through life and when they do have trouble, they think that somehow fate is against them, that they have somehow singled out for singular punishment. The fact is that everybody has trouble. Everybody has disappointments. Everybody has weak moments. Everybody has disappointing moments. Everyone has failures. Everyone has to change course to accommodate an obstacle that was not anticipated. So I think that to the degree that we could be stable people, and not have psychological problems, we ought to expect to have trouble and to be prepared for it. And, and that's where the broadening of one's mind, the broadening of, of one's heart comes in, to shift direction and to accommodate changing times. And the last bit of advice is don't give up. There has to be an element of tenacity. This is particularly true in the political arena. You only have to read the biography of Abraham Lincoln to see that almost every time he ever ran anything, he got beat. But he kept coming back, he kept plugging away, and eventually he succeeded. And I could go down the litany of things. I don't have time to cover that as well. So don't give up. This is a fast-changing technological world. But there are some things that don't change, kind of like an anchor. Integrity, truth, competence, compassion, those kind of things don't change, no matter what we might do or what circumstance might confront us. And I would say, don't be afraid of failure. That doesn't mean to go into something anticipating or being willing to fail. One of the great football quarterbacks of all time said, you show me a good loser, I'll show you a loser. You shouldn't go into something quiescent, willing to fail. 
But I would say to anyone who's not attempting something where you might fail, doesn't have faith in oneself or in the worthiness of the goal. Well, in closing, let me say that you have a good start in life. Some of you have accomplished things already. I don't know you personally. But I would say that life holds for you a lot of challenges and a lot of great opportunities and a lot of excitement and a lot of happiness and a lot of adventure. And, and if you keep an, an inquisitive mind, a, a flexible approach to things, that's a key to a life of greatness. I tried to think of a story to conclude my, my uh, talk. And the only one that comes to mind is about a young college student, not nearly so advanced as you, who was a wise guy. He always had a different approach from what the professor wanted. And the professors don't like that very much. They like to maintain the status quo. They like for their courses to be taught by rote. I'm one of them. I've been teaching now for five years. And there's a shock sometimes when you get this unique student that always has got a different approach. It takes time. Well, this young man was in a science class in sophomore year. And the professor's question was, how do you use a barometer to measure the height of a building? And the college student gave a wise answer. So the professor said, look, I'm not even going to let you answer the question. You come to my office after class today because your passing this course depends on your performance. And the young man walked in to the professor's office and he said, Professor, that question is so easy. He said, I can think of four different ways to use a barometer to measure the height of a building. He said, the first one is the one that you had in the book. You measure the pressure at the bottom, you climb the building, you measure the atmospheric pressure at the top, and you can compute the height. The professor said, if you tell me three more ways, I'll pass you in this course. And the student said, okay, the first one is that you take the barometer on a sunny day and you sit it on, set it on the ground and you measure the height of the barometer and the length of the shadow. And then you measure the length of the shadow of the building at the same time and you can compute the height of the building. The professor said, okay, that worked. But you've got two to go. And the professor said, okay. You take a string and you go to the top of the building, tied on the barometer, and you lower the barometer to the touches the ground. <laughs> and you mark the place on the string, and then you get a tape measure, and you measure the length of the string. <laughs> the professor says, you need not go any further. I understand <laughs> what you're having to say. But he said, you still got one to go. And the young man says, okay, you take your barometer back up to the top of the building. Don't take the string. Drop the barometer. Time how long it takes to hit the ground, and you can compute the height of the building. The professor was very angry. He said, that's a trick. I'm not going to give you a passing grade. But by that time, the provost of the college came walking by, who happens to be in the business school. And they had the argument, and the provost came in to see what was going on. They explained it to him. And the provost said, well, that's a very innovative approach. And I'm going to be the referee. But suppose you're in the business school. How would you use a barometer to measure the height of the building? And the young fellow said, well, sir, if you don't mind my saying so, that is quite easy. I take this nice barometer out of its box. I walk over to the building superintendent's office, and I say to him, here's a nice barometer, it costs $35. I'll give it to you if you'll tell me how tall the building is. <laughs> well, The point I want to make is, in closing, that, that life is that way. And you can see that when you start thinking about different ways to accomplish a worthy goal, like measuring the height of the building, there are a lot of ways to go about it. And I would like to, to say, I'm proud of you. You have graduated from a great college. You live in the greatest nation on earth. You have almost unlimited opportunities. I hope you'll never put a limit on yourself. I hope you'll never be afraid of the embarrassment of potential defeat in a great effort. And you'll always be thinking of another way 
to measure the height of a building with a barometer. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the honorary degrees will now be conferred. The Board of Trustees has authorized the induction of three persons as honorary members of the class of 1987. In your programs, you will find a brief biographical sketch of each of these honorees. It is my honor to present for the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws one of the outstanding American political leaders of this century a champion of peace, a champion of human rights throughout the world, former President of the United States, Jimmy Carter. Thank you, Chairman David Grissom. Jimmy Carter, we honor you today as one of the foremost world statesmen of our time. As the first Southern president since Reconstruction, you brought a new confidence to your native region. As our nation's leader, you summoned us to address the challenges of the future, however difficult they seemed. You worked tirelessly 
to overcome the divisions that race, nationality, and history have created in the human family, due largely to your intense personal involvement, two bitter rivals in the Middle East reached an historic treaty to end armed conflict and bloodshed. Your steadfast efforts for peace in this troubled corner of the world demonstrates your abiding goodwill beyond self-seeking. Finally, you have shown that in the turbulent world of leadership, high ethical standards can be compatible with the heaviest of responsibilities. In recognition of your statesmanship and your devotion to this nation's highest principles, I am pleased to confer on you, under the authority of the Board of Trustees of Center College, the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws with all its honors, rights, and privileges. I therefore present you with this diploma and ask that you be invested with the appropriate hood.